another big edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. And why is it big? Because we have a chance right now to talk to our own Larry Hedrick about his experiences with Apache Land. My job out at Queen Valley, uh, living in the rock house and running cattle was over. I got into Pete for about $800. And uh, he, he stood out in front of the rock house and waved his hand out there and said, I'll trade you some land rather than the, uh, the money. And uh, I, I declined. And today that land is right in the middle of the golf course out there. Larry, how did you get started at Apache Land? Uh, how I found Apache Land is a mystery to me because there was no Gold Canyon. You know, Gold Canyon didn't really get started until about 1974 when Harold Chris put it all together. But uh, somebody must have told me about it, and I just showed up and wearing my cowboy duds that I wore every day, but I did have my gun strapped on. And there was nothing in Apache Land. There was no, there was no Main Street or anything like that. It hadn't been built yet. And uh, there was just one single row of buildings that they called Hangtown. And uh, I stood there with a small crowd watching uh, skits being put on. And uh, it was all put on to audio the audio was telling the story. The people were just reenacting the, what they heard on the audio. And when the crowd dispersed after a skit, I just kind of mingled with the players and uh, kind of got accepted that way. And then uh, one day uh, somebody didn't show up and uh, this guy that was the sheriff, which was about a six foot six guy, and I don't remember anybody's name out there, but uh, he just says, get out there and do it. Well, what do I do? He says, just listen to the tape and do what the tape says. So I used to walk out in the middle of the street and there was a girl coming my way, a, a late teenager. And uh, as I moved, she changed her course to match mine. She coming straight at me and uh, I'm not hearing anything. I'm just, I'm just sitting there worried about what, what what's gonna happen. And uh, she gets right up against me and the gun a gun goes off and she falls right in my arms. And I lay her down and, and I, I'm not hearing anything that they're talking about on that audio. I'm just reacting to what happened. And I look where the gunshot come from and there was a guy standing there with his gun in his hand at, in an alleyway. And, and I, I drew my gun and started after him and the sheriff come along and took the gun away from me and uh, like to tore my fingers off, you know? And uh, so that's the way the first one happened. And I was listening to him a little bit later and I heard the sheriff say, well, I liked his action, acting. I actually had to take a gun away from him, you know? So from then on, they started using me. There was no pay. It was just, you know, uh, I had that 800 bucks, you know, and that today that was the purchasing power of about $7,000 today. And I, I wasn't looking for a job or anything. I was just having fun and running around. And uh, so one weekend we were out there and I happened to be behind the row of buildings, which uh, were not complete. They didn't have any doors or windows on the sides. The fronts were complete, but there was an obvious intention to finish them up. And I happened to walk by the back of this one building and looked in and there sat Clint Walker on a couch. Surprised the heck out of me. And I struck up a conversation with the guy. And just about that time, Charlie Aldridge come in and just ripped me up one side and down the other. Who lets you in here? You know, I ought to throw you off the set. You know, <laughs> the, the guy just ripped me something terrible. And I just turned around, walked away and um, Fifty years later, I was over at Scottsdale at one of the festivals of the West, and there sat Clint Walker selling pictures and books and stuff. So I got in this long line, and when I got up to Clint, I said, uh, say, listen, do you remember being out at Patchland? He said, oh yeah, that was 1959. And I said, do you happen to remember some kid talking to you and Aldrich started ripping on him? He says, yeah, I remember that. I felt so sorry for that kid. I said, well, that was me. <laughs> so, you know, I, it was just a month or two later that the uh, giant pagoda of the superstitions took place. And when that was over, I went back to Oklahoma for my birthday to see my mother. 
And it was six years before I came back. I came back permanently to Arizona in 1966. So I went out to Apache land and, and, and to see, and here it was all complete. It was a wonderful place, large cloud, crowds and, and more skits going on, but they weren't using the audio anymore. And I didn't have much to do with uh, Apache land for the next few years. Larry, I'm impressed. I hear you have a lot of pull with the Air Force. I do remember being out there one time when some director was trying to film a movie. The planes from William Air Force Base were just destroying him. Every time he tried to say anything, here come a jet. And he was so frustrated there about the sixth time that happened, he just threw everything down on the ground and says, I don't know what we're going to do. And I said, uh, I walked up to him and I said, well, why don't you call Williams Air Force Base and have them change the flight path? Well, they wouldn't do that. I said, they'll do it. They cooperate very well with you. You call Williams Air Force Base, ask to talk to the, uh, talk to the officer on the flight line and tell them who you are and what you're doing. And I'll bet you they'll change the flight paths. They've got several flight paths. paths. And uh, so he went in the office and about 10 minutes later, he come out and he just stood there for a little while. Wasn't a plane in the air. And so he started filming and he never even looked over and said thanks. <laughs> but anyway, in the late 70s, I, um, I formed the Calvary reenactment unit. And uh, about half my guys were on the west side of Phoenix and most of those had horses. And the guys out here in the East Valley, uh, we, you know, we were always going over to Pioneer Village or, or Ron Nix's A Day in the West, uh, you know, way, way west of Phoenix to do things. And I was kind of looking for a home. So I went out to Apache Land and made a deal with Sue Sillerman. And um, we went out on the back lot and the back lot was nothing more than a junkyard. It was horrible. Just every piece of trash you could imagine was out there in this 10 acres. So I called in all the infantry and uh, artillery guys and uh, my cavalry, and we spent a couple of weekends just cleaning that place up. And we, re we removed all the junk from that 10 acres out behind the place uh, to the east. You know, Apache Land had a fort wall in the front and guard towers, and this was to be our home. And we done a lot of things there just for ourselves, reenactments and stuff, and inviting other units from around the state to come in. And from time to time, we did our own little skits for what crowd was there, and, and you know, and uh, it, it was just a lot of fun. But uh, in, it was 79 that um, uh, we decided to, to do a major event, and we publicized it very well, and this was called a prelude to Gettysburg. And we had the infantry redoubts and a little rock wall for pickets charge, because that's what we were reenacting. And we set up explosives and, and set off charges and all that. And we had all our casualties planned out. And there was over a thousand people there to watch this thing. And it was on July 4th. It was pretty warm. <laughs> we, we called Apache Land our home until uh, about 1983. But in the early 80s, uh, Red Wolverton was, uh, was managing the place and he was trying to buy it. The, the price, if I recall at that time, was a million and a half for Apache land. And every time he went in to try to make a deal, the price went up and he got pretty frustrated about it. But Red is well known in the movie industries You've probably seen his stagecoach many times in many movies and just didn't even know who it was. But he had a, he, he had a, a, a Concorde stagecoach that was made back east, it just absolutely 100% authentic. And it cost $64,000. Uh, and he had all his own horses. He always run a six-up team. And it was my privilege one time he allowed me to drive his stagecoach. And that was a real experience to drive a six-up team. And, uh, but he finally got frustrated and went down to uh, Old Tucson. And that's where a lot of, most of his movie making was done, it was Old Tucson. And he used to rent stuff from me for the movies. 
Uh, he rented all my saddles for Hubba Bubba Bubblegum commercials. And uh, he rented a wagon from me and attached a team of horses to it. And I drove it in a race uh, that they didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to win. His daughter was supposed to win a race in another wagon. And there was about 20 wagons involved in this race. And that was an exciting experience, I want to tell you, going out of there at full speed. And his daughter liked to never talk to me again. <laughs> and of course, we had to reshoot the whole thing because she had to win. And, uh, and then about, you know, Ron Nix was out there all that time. He helped build the main street of Apache Lamb. I don't know if he was involved in Hangtown or not, although he talked a lot about it like he was involved. If he was there when I was, I don't remember him because I don't remember anybody's names. And our paths crossed many times in movies and commercials, and we didn't even know each other. And, uh, but he, he had me collaborate with him to use my cavalry to the um, a Day in the West out at uh, what was called Cowtown at that time. And uh, we made several movies and commercials out at Cowtown with the Calvary and, and things like that. And it, it was just, uh, just a wonderful time at Apache Land. It was just our home base for the Calvary. Well, there you have it. Mystery solved. Larry Hedrick and his association with Apache Land. This guy is not just a pretty face.